Hey there everyone, welcome to Tales and Text and I'm your host Inisha and uh, people who are following me for the Mahabharata Bori reviews, guess what? I finished the volume 7 of the critical edition of the Mahabharata and as you can see there are tons of notes that I have made and lots of lots of uh, interesting things to discuss. Uh, volume 7 um, has been an emotional roller coaster. Uh, one of the things that I want to discuss is first of all, I think I'm going to divide this video into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the book itself, Volume 7. Then I want to talk a little bit about how Volume 7 differs from Volumes um, 5 and 6, which were also narratives of the war. And um, I think I'll finally share some, some perspectives that I have about uh, the results of the war. Because, uh, you know, generally when we look at how people view the Mahabharata war, how people view the relationship between the Pandavas and the Kauravas, they, they, they retain a very right and wrong, black and white sort of a perspective, which is, which to me doesn't honestly, uh, it doesn't hold true of the nuances that are there uh, in the epic itself. And I want to discuss a little bit about that. Uh, so get something to eat, get something to drink, you know, settle in, relax, and uh, we'll jump right into the review. All right. So starting off volume 7 um covers days 16 17 and 18 of the war um we have come to the point where uh drona is also dead and uh, duryodhana instates karna as the commander of his army and it's a very interesting um decision um see because honestly it's the right decision for Duryodhana because Karna is one of the strongest warriors in his army right now and it does make sense because uh, Karna also has taken a vow to kill Arjuna and uh, the Pandavas also consider their enmity towards Karna to be sometimes stronger than their enmity towards Duryodhana I mean I would rather say I think Bhima is the only one who has a true enmity towards Duryodhana uh, the others just don't like him because of how they've treated him but they still have that healthy amount of respect because Duryodhana is still their cousin but with Karna because they don't know that Karna is related to them the Pandavas actually genuinely hate him um, so Karna Parva actually starts off uh, really in a very interesting way. Now all of the other um, days when you see people being made commanders and uh, just the days of the war when they're starting, you see that uh, initially you get the description of the Vyuha, uh, which uh, warrior stands in which location of the Vyuha. Uh, what the shape of the Vyuha is, what the strengths of the Vyuha were, were. And then you look at it from both perspectives, that is Pandava Vyuha and Kaurava Vyuha. Then the war starts. We, we first find out generally which major characters battled each other and who died. And then we look at the foot soldiers, the horses, the elephants, the chariots, and finally we go into the major battles. And that has predominantly been what uh, the days, I would say 1 to 15, the descriptions have been. But Karna Parva, which basically encapsulates days 16 and 17, uh, it follows a different way. The Karna Parva itself is around 300, 310 pages long uh, in, in this book. And the first 150 to 160 pages are not at all about the war itself. Rather, they are a discussion between Shalya and Karna. So Duryodhana says, you know what, Karna, I'm making you the commander. You have to kill Arjuna for me. And uh, because that's the only way if Arjuna is dead, then they then the Pandavas will lose a big advantage. And therefore, we can defeat them easily. So Karna says, you know what, for that, I will need a good charioteer because Krishna is the charioteer for Arjuna. And so I need a good charioteer. So can you give me Shalya? So Shalya is actually offended by this because Shalya is, he feels, you know, I'm a real king, whereas Karna is just Adhirata's uh, son, he's a charioteer's son, so how can you expect me to become a charioteer for a charioteer's son? So there's a lot of discussion between Duryodhana and Shalya that, that kind of uh, goes into this class, caste, hierarchical uh, discussion where Shalya shows a lot of prejudice against Karna. And Duryodhana is a very, very skillful person. Uh, negotiator honestly you know what if Duryodhana was a modern day manager he would be an excellent manager <laughs> because Duryodhana is very very good at 
uh, navigating people's egos, at getting work done, and at making sure that all of his uh, employees are actually happy. So all the people in his army, all his commanders, all his soldiers, genuinely really respect him. They love him, and that's one thing that is like something that is so so obvious throughout the course of Kurukshetra War. That no matter what Duryodhana has done in his personal life towards the Pandavas, as a warrior, he's a very very respected and renowned warrior. And so Sharia finally agrees based on what Duryodhana um, tells him, and he agrees to become Karna's uh, charioteer. And he promises Duryodhana that he will not say or do anything that will distract Karna from his task of defeating Arjuna. But as we see uh, that those that that small bit of time that it takes for Sharia to drive Karna to the front of the army, that is from the camps to the front of the army where he'll be heading the army on day sixteen. Shalya berates Karna and he basically talks down to him. He's condescending to him, and he makes very derogatory statements about Karna. And Karna gets really angry, and he, Karna also retorts to Shalya, and he talks to Shalya. He he derogates the people of Madra, and Madras uh, because you know Shalya is Madras king. And so there's this back and forth that happens. And during this back and forth, it's a very emotional. discussion because shalya really you know makes very under the belt comments you know he really hits below the belt he makes comments that strike at karna's heart at those sore spots uh, of karna's being for example shalya make shalya questions his parentage shalya questions his relationship with duryodhana he basically insinuates that karna that duryodhana never really liked karna and that karna is only his slave his vassal and all these things it's 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 a very it's a very emotional parva i would say karna parva is so emotional um first off because in this first part of the uh, of karna parva the conversation with shalya and karna you really see those sore spots that make karna vulnerable that those things about himself about his parentage about his relationships his relationship with his with his mother kunti his relationship with his brothers who consider him to be their enemy his relationship with duryodhana his friend who but where the power dynamics are also very skewed he is always you know internally although it's not very visible and obvious in the first six books you can imagine that under the surface you know karna does wonder about his place in the kuru society he does wonder about his place in the world these are sore spots for him he feels vulnerable when discussing about this when thinking about this these are things that make him feel bad because he's never got any closure and i think that's one of the saddest parts about karna you know he was a great warrior but i think he never had that closure or that sense of fulfillment that you know i i could mend relationships i could find out why my mother abandoned me i could that my mother actually loved me and she had to give me up because of circumstances he never had that closure even when in in i believe this was in volume 4 yeah volume 4 when kunti goes to meet karna she never tells him that he she cared about him or that she was forced to give him up because there was no other choice rather she begs him to uh, come back as her son so that she can save her other sons so i mean you can you can also say that it makes sense for kunti because she has never really known karna and even if you are a birth parent to a child if the child if you've given up the child um, to and you don't get a chance to grow up with the child while you may retain some amount of love for them you don't truly care for them as much as the child that you raise in your own house every single day so i think so it does make sense for kunti to try to get karna on her side just to save her other sons but but for karna himself it he's short changed he never gets a mother he never gets a he never gets brothers he never gets a family he never truly finds out whether duryodhana really loved him or whether this was just a power and i was honestly my personal opinion is that i think duryodhana really respected karna i think duryodhana really loved karna i think their relationship was very genuine because one of the things that you notice in karna parva is that when there are battles not just in karna parva i would say even prior to karna parva whenever there are battles where karna is fighting and he's on the verge of losing duryodhana gets really panicked and he wants to save karna and in fact he has sacrificed a lot of his own brothers to keep karna safe now there could be a question as to whether duryodhana did this because uh he wanted to make sure his fight against arjuna his weapon against arjuna that is karna would be safe but i also believe that in addition to that he genuinely did care about karna 
um, <clears throat> so in the first half of Karna Parva, you see this these conversations between Shalya and Karna, and they are so heartbreaking because they really hit the core of what Karna is feeling, those insecurities that he has. In the second part of Karna Parva, the last 150 pages of the 300, 310 pages uh, Parva, you see the actual battles between uh, Karna and the Pandava army, in particular Karna versus the Pandavas. And again, this is such an emotional Parva. And, and, and I say this because, you know, Karna is known to be an excellent warrior, yet the focus of Karna Parva is not on his battle prowess. So, for example, in volume 6, the largest part of the book was Drona Parva. And Drona, no, you know, he's known as a master war tactician. And the, the entire volume six focus was on battle techniques. It was a focus on battle strategies, on, on the strengths and weaknesses of warriors. Now, if you have watched my volume six review, you will also remember that I spoke a lot in a lot of detail about the actual nitty gritties of the war strategies, war tactics, the weapons that were used. And so there was a, it was a very brutal, bloody and very physical, um, physical, I would say, manifestation of the war. Volume 6. Volume 7 actually traverses a lot of the mental and emotional trauma and baggage that most of these warriors carry. And rather than focusing on the actual battle scenes, and there are quite a few battle scenes, yes, but not as many as in Volume 6, the focus is more on the emotional traumas, the mental baggages, the, the, the past that they carry with them and, and what's brought them to this moment. So the second half of Karana Parva, you actually see a lot of, you, while, while the battle scenes are going on, it's so ironical that every time Karna fails off with one of his brothers, see his brothers don't know that Karna is their brother, right? Only he's aware of it because Kunti told him and Krishna told him before the war began. And when Karna is battling them, he's very acutely aware that, and, and there, there are many moments when he could he could easily have killed Yudhishthira also. But in that one, one minor instance of disloyalty to Duryodhana, he lets him go. And he does feel sad that he's being forced to fight with his brothers. On the other hand, the other Pandavas, the kind of hate that they spew towards Karna while they are battling him, the kind of things that they say to him, the kind of conversations they have amongst themselves about Karna, it is filled with so much vile hatred, so much prejudice. It is actually heartbreaking. Because every time these conversations keep coming up, you as a reader and you know, you as a reader, you as a listener, you are constantly thinking about the fact that, you know, the Pandavas, they're known for their filial loyalty, for their brotherhood. And they're talking about like this, they're talking in such bad ways about Karana, about their oldest brother without realizing that he's their brother. They are... Uh, they are joyous about the prospect of murdering him. They are discussing how to kill him. They are they are thinking of all the ways they can celebrate once Karana is dead, and it's just it's just really heartbreaking. I think when I was reading the entire Karana Parva, I was just feeling so 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 sad at the irony of it all. That you know you see a family that is torn apart, and you see how. Um, you know, brothers who don't know that this, this other person is their flesh and blood and they're plotting to kill him, that they're rejoicing at his defeat, at his at his humiliation. Um, they're finding ways to trick him, to deceive him and to kill him. And you know that Yudhishthira is going to regret this later. And that's the, that's, the, that, that's something that, you know, you're obviously, you're, you're very, very, very acutely aware of that you know Yudhishthira is going to regret this later because despite all of his strategies and all of his you know i would whether strengths or weakness of character you could say his flaws yudhishthira does love his brothers and he does value those filial relationships quite a lot you know he's going to end up regretting whatever he says about karna whatever he does to karna <clears throat> so karna parva was just was just really um an emotional um an emotional time i would say and I actually almost like felt like crying when I was reading this parva. Uh, there is, there is, uh, and you know the irony is uh, one of the things that they mention in this book is that Karna's bow is called Vijaya. Now, for example, Arjuna's bow is called Gandiva. Uh, Karna's bow is called Vijaya, and it's so ironical and sad that Karna's bow is called Vijaya or Victory uh, when Karna's entire life 
has not been victorious there is no vijaya for him he has not gained victory in, on the personal front because he never had a family yes adhirata and and radha and his and his adoptive family were were very very uh, loving very kind very accepting and i would say that in itself is vijaya victory in itself but i think for karna personally he he, he always was looking for more one might even make a you know question whether karna was truly grateful for adhirata and radha adopting him and i think in some ways he was but i think for the largest part of his life karna was searching for his true purpose for his true family to fit in because he believed he deserved better and he knew that he was actually not from the charioteer class so again i i don't know i don't know whether i should i should be rate karna for being ungrateful for being uh, you know adopted by someone and for being loved so much and for being given whatever they could possess in their capacity they did for him i don't know whether i should be rate him for for still searching for his true family or you know in a way this is also i can understand because a lot of people who are adopted they do try to search for their you know their birth families if not for anything else just to find get that closure just to meet them to see who they might have turned out you know if they had if they had not been uh, given up for adoption for example or in karna's case not been abandoned it's a it's a very it's a very um, it's a very sensitive uh topic it's a very emotionally raw topic uh it's a i would say that you know karna's life is is about you know i would say it's more about like you know chosen family versus blood family um <clears throat> one of the things that um also stood out to me in karna parva is how you know at this point you know initially when krishna goes in volume 4 to speak to karna and ask him to switch sides to to give up on duryodhana and to come to the other side karna refuses and says no i have chosen duryodhana because duryodhana chose me at my time of need uh by this point in volume 7 in the book um krishna is very much you know already uh, you know he he has accepted the fact that karna he does not consider karna a pandava he does not consider karna a kaunteya that is kunti san he considers karna as uh, duryodhana's friend and so when he he so he actively tries to instigate the pandavas to kill karna in fact at the at the last moment just a few moments before his death i'm sure people who know the epic are are very familiar with this uh, because of parshurama's curse and because of the curse of the brahman brahman whose cow he will have accidentally killed uh, karna starts to forget his mantras he's not able to call on any divine weapons his uh, chariot's wheel is stuck in the mud and he can't move and he has to jump down and try to manually pull it out and he requests arjuna to stop and to not kill him at that time when he is unarmed and when he is uh, <clears throat> basically he's in he's he's in a position where he cannot defend himself and arjuna actually feels like you know uh, he doesn't want to kill an unarmed person and he also wants his victory over karna to be solid like you know not not tainted with the fact that oh you harmed an unarmed man but then you know but krishna you know he's 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 very practical he doesn't consider karna a pandava anymore he he reminds arjuna about abhimanyu's death he reminds arjuna about draupadi's um, humiliation when during the sabha parva karna will be the one who will have told everyone you know take draupadi's clothes as well he reminds arjuna this and he says you know he does not deserve your compassion you must kill him irrespective of what's happening and that's when arjuna kills him so you see uh, you know in 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 to me in this way kar the relation i think krishna uh, as an adopted child himself and an adopted is is a is a is i wouldn't say it kind of encapsulates everything about krishna's life but you see how uh, you know krishna's journey from being born in the prison to being you know raised uh, you know with balrama and with the gopis it's a it's krishna's journey is of you know from a birth family to a chosen family to an adoptive family karna's journey is also similar to that he is from a birth family to a chosen family to an adoptive family his chosen family is duryodhana and i think krishna sort of respects that he respects the fact that you know karna has chosen duryodhana the duryodhana is his family now and therefore in his eyes he, karna is no longer a pandava uh, it's a again you know it's it's very hard for me to explain how emotional this uh, parva is karna parva is 
I just feel like everyone has to read this parva. It is so beautiful. It is, it is heartbreaking. It is just um. Yeah, and you know, in the end, when Yudhishthira and everyone, I one one thing I actually want to talk about before I forget because I feel like I might forget saying this. Um, Karna Parva is very interestingly the only Parva so far in in this in the Mahabharata Bodhi series. Now I've read seven books, like I said, in this series, and this is the only Parva where you actually see active dissension, argument, and breaks between the five Pandavas. Um, in the larger grand scheme of things where we have Karna, their oldest brother, fighting the five younger brothers. The five younger brothers are not aware of that fact that he's their elder brother. You also see those cracks developing between the five Pandavas as well. Brother is fighting against brother. Not physically, I'm talking about verbally. Because mentally they're not at, on the same page and they are really pissed off at each other. Um, some examples are, you know, during the war, you know, Bhima says something to Yudhishthira and then Yudhishthira says something to Bhima. Uh, one major part is when, you know, Arjuna is unable to kill Karna and then he comes and he tells Yudhishthira, look, I have not been able to kill uh, Karna, but I, I will do so right now. And Yudhishthira is pissed off and he, he scolds Arjuna so much and he basically says, you know, I wish you had died in Kunti's womb. You are a waste of space and a waste of resources. If you could have just told me that you did not have the guts to kill our enemy, I would not even have bothered to, uh, you know, to bring you to this war. And you are the reason of why we are all afflicted in this way. You should have died in Kunti's womb. So this is what Yudhishthira says. And it is such a shocking <laughs> moment um, where, you know, Yudhishthira like, he just stops short of cursing Arjuna and Arjuna is so pissed off he wants to kill Yudhishthira. He actually picks up his sword and is about to attack Yudhishthira physically because he's so pissed. Krishna stops him and then he gives him <laughs> he gives him other techniques of uh, basically disrespecting Yudhishthira through his words. Um, and this is one of those instances where you actually see Krishna's, um, I would say, political astuteness, you could say, or you could say cleverness, because he knows how to hurt people without physically hurting them. So it's, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting section of the Karna Parva. But essentially, things like this happen a lot. You see dissension between uh, Arjuna and Yudhishthira, like I said. Yudhishthira makes a comment about Bhima as well and then Arjuna defends Bhima saying that at least Bhima and I are killing people and what are you doing? You just hide behind your uh, behind your white umbrella of kingship and you let us do your dirty work. Have you even killed a single person? Which is in fact very true because I did mention this in volume 6 as well. Yudhishthira does not fight. I believe I had mentioned this, you know, when I when I compared Duryodhana and Yudhishthira, that Dur when when there when Duryodhana's army is in trouble, Duryodhana jumps head first and he protects everyone, irrespective of whether they are important warriors or their infantry. Duryodhana fights. Yudhishthira does not fight. I had mentioned this in Volume Six as well, and it is something that Arjuna calls out Yudhishthira for, and he says that at least Bhima and I are killing people. We are doing our task. What are you doing? You have not killed a single person. Who you said you will kill you are just hiding behind us and you are you're not even lifting your uh, your weapons which is a fact so you see that that those emotions the tempos are just boiling and overflowing and karna parva you know it's it's very beautiful because of that you see those brotherly relations being tested from all angles and it is such a beautifully written parva i think this is one of the best parvas uh, in terms of the literary narrative and the literary devices that they've used, literary capacity, Karna Parva is stunning, 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 stunning. It is so tragic, it's so heartbreaking, it's so moving. Oh my God, I cannot, I cannot emphasize how much I love this Parva. It is beautiful. And if you can get your hands on Karna Parva, please do give it a read. It's very, very beautifully written. Okay. Um, I think I'll stop talking about Karna Parva, Karna Parva now, otherwise I think my ent entire review will be only about Karna Parva. Um, day 16, day 17, Karna Parva, Karna is killed at the end of day 17. Uh, day 18 dawns and Shalya is made the commander. Shalya Parva is a short Parva comparatively to all the other Parvas because compared to all the other commanders, he that is Bhishma, Drona and Karna, Shalya has the shortest reign so far. Uh, which is only for half a day. That is before noon. He's, he's made commander early in the morning at dawn. And before noon, he's killed. Shalya Parva, once again, 
<clears throat> because Arjuna says, you know, he, he confronts Yudhishthira that, you know, you not killed anyone. Um, Yudhishthira says, you know what, I will kill Shalya. I take him as my share of the kill. I will kill him and I will ensure that Duryodhana is left alone without any supporters. And Shalya Par Parva is, uh, to, to, to a large part, it just it does follow uh, the typical conventional narratives that we've been following from day one to day 15. Uh, the the battles are, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's um, too intense, but I will say this, that Shalya is in fact, I think the best warrior so far that we've read. You know, people say that Bhishma was an incredible warrior. People say Drona was an incredible warrior. People say Karna is an incredible warrior. And yes, to an extent that is true. Bhishma is a good warrior in the sense that he's brave and he has the wisdom of many years. Drona is an excellent war strategist and therefore because of his strategies, he's, he knows how to get things done you, resulting in the minimal usage of weapons and minimal loss of lives. Karna is strong purely because of his uh, bravado and his recklessness, I would say to an extent. Shalya is actually a very, very good fighter because of his skill, his prowess, his bravery and his technique. It is in Shalya Parva that you actually find out just how good Shalya is as a fighter. And uh, it's a shame that, this, that the epic doesn't really focus on Shalya's fighting abilities until Shalya Parva comes up. Uh, because Shalya could easily have been one of the best fighters in the entire lot. Uh, so you see Shalya Parva actually showcasing Shalya as a fighter and you can see why people respect him so much um <clears throat> shalya parva is also where uh, you find out how much the uh, how, how many army or i would say how many akshauhinis are still left on both the sides in fact i've actually made a note here uh, when the uh, war started Duryodhana had 11 Akshavhinis uh, and one Akshavhini consists of 65,610 horses, uh, 24 lakhs, 5,700 Rathas, that is the, your um, warriors, 21,870 chariots, 21,870 elephants, um, 1,9350 infantry. Similarly, this is one Akshavhini. So Duryodhana had 11 Akshavhinis like that and uh, the Pandavas had 7 Akshavhinis. Uh, by the end of the war, that is on day 18, uh, the Kauravas have only 11,000 Rathas, 10,700 chariots, 2 lakh horses and uh, 3 crore infantry. Uh, the number of chariots have not been mentioned. Pandava army had 6,000 Rathas, 6,000 elephants, 10,000 horses and 1 crore infantry. So you can see that it's considerably come down and, and at this point on day 18, they're almost on neck and neck paces. Even though technically the Pandava army is slightly smaller than the Kaurava army by Shalya Parva, at the end of Shalya Parva, I would say. Uh, in terms of the quality of warriors, I think only Duryodhana, uh, Ashwatthama and Shalya are, and I would say to a certain extent, maybe Krita Varma, but Ashwatthama, the Duryodhana and Shalya are the only three people who of actual uh, skill and capacity on the Kaurava side whereas the Pandava side has uh, Bhima, Arjuna, they have Krishna. Krishna doesn't technically fight but you know Krishna is very good as a charioteer and also as a strategist so that adds a lot of weightage even though Krishna himself doesn't fight. Um, you have Satyaki, you have Rishtadyumna, you have uh, you have Shikandi. Shikandi also is not maybe so much, but but the Shrima does fight quite a bit. So you have a lot of other warriors on the Pandava side who are who are really good at what they do versus compared to the number of people on the Kaurava side. So although the Kaurava do have a slightly higher number of uh, warriors and the army size compared to the Pandavas, in terms of the their, their capacity and their skill, I think they're both pretty much on an even footing right now. So it shows, it gives you a lot of context in terms of how ahead the Pandava army has forged. Uh, Bhima and Arjuna in particular, uh, you will you see the amount of uh, havoc that they've wrecked on the Kaurava army that over the course of the 18 day war, the Kaurava army is, is almost depleted. So Shalya Parva actually also focuses on, you know, not just the death of Shalya, but also the death of Shalya's son and Shalya's younger brother. Um, we <clears throat> also see um, in Shalya Vada Parva, uh, you know, at this point, you know, at the end of Shalya Vada Parva, we see Shalya is killed 
and it is at this point in time that Shakuni decides to take over. He is not made a commander officially because this is still, as I said, it's just the mid middle of the day. It's not even noon yet. It's not even noon yet. It's just been a few hours. Um, Shakuni takes over and he tells Duryodhana, you know what, I will kill your enemies. And uh, it is at this stage that you see uh, uh, Nakula and Saradeva actually being given a little prominence. And I want to actually talk about this a little bit because, you know, throughout the course of this, uh, of, of the 18 day war, you hardly hear about Nakula and Sahadeva. You might hear uh, them being mentioned in terms of where they stood in the Vyuha, uh, like where they stood in the right flank or the left flank, in the center, at the front or the back. So you 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 hear of Nakula and Sahadeva only from that perspective. Uh, but you don't see them in action. You don't see them fighting. Uh, rather, what you see is only Arjuna and Bhima mostly sometimes Yudhishthira and the rest is mostly focused on the other side that is uh, the Kaurava side and only when necessary the Shudhima and Shikandi will come in like for example when Bhishma was killed or Drona was killed but beyond that you, you see more of the Kaurava fighters rather than the Pandava fighters you don't really hear a lot about Nakula and Saradeva it is only after Shalya is killed when Shakuni takes over that you see Sahadeva in particular um, get that sort of limelight because Sahadeva is the one who kills Shakuni and you know, this this actually makes me wonder because initially before I started reading the Mahabharata, I was reading a lot of theories. Some theories are actually proposed by Bibek de Broy himself. Other theories are proposed by other writers, other interpreters and other translators. And a lot of people wonder whether Sahadeva and Nakula actually existed. Uh, whether they were real people, um, real family members of Yudhishthira and Arjuna and Bhima. Or were they just, um, you know, added into the story over time? You know, some people wonder whether there were only three brothers or with, some people wonder whether there were only just two brothers, one brother who was more intellectual, who was more like Yudhishthira, another brother who kind of brought in the qualities of Arjuna and Bhima together, who was more physically strong and all the other narratives about their family sort of were built up and embellished over time. So there are a lot of theories like that. And and I do feel, I do wonder that, you know, whether Nakula and Sahadeva actually existed in reality because you never really hear about them or you hear from them. You don't hear their voice, you don't hear them speaking, you don't hear their... You don't see their fighting, and it is only in these last few pages of Shalyavada Parva that you actually see um, <clears throat> Sahadeva come into the limelight when he's trying to kill Shakuni. So Shakuni and Uluka are both killed. Uluka is Shakuni's son, so they're both uh, killed. And um, on seeing that Shalya, Shakuni, and Uluka are all killed, Ashwatthama, Kripa, and Kritavarma decide to flee. And it's really interesting because, you know, Ashwatthama is all, like, yeah, you'll remember that I said in, you know, volume six that, you know, Ashwatthama has a very short fuse. He's kind of like those dictators who's willing to pull the trigger on the nuclear war weapons if he can, whenever he can. So he's like that, but you also see that Ashwatthama is also a coward. But then again, I also wonder because I don't want to be too judgmental. Uh, according to Shatya Dharma, yes, Ashwatthama, Kripa and Krita Varma were cowardly. But then again, Ashwatthama and Kripa are not Kshatriyas, they're Brahmins. Uh, but they're Brahmanas who function as Kshatriyas, so they are not actually fulfilling the dharma of either Kshatriya or Brahmana. Um, so you see a lot of these kinds of nuances come into the picture. But on a more human level, I do kind of understand why they fled. You know, you they they you know in the book they don't see because the the confusion is so much. The Pandavas are annihilating their army. They can't see where Duryodhana is, and they and they fear that Duryodhana is dead. And so in their minds, are like if Duryodhana is dead, what is the point of us continuing in the war? And so they decide to flee. And humanly, it does make sense. You know, if it's 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 sort of like asking people to you know like if you ask them stay back and fight i mean what's the point right i mean it's not their battle their king is no longer seen and for all they know yudhishthira has already won they might as well call it quits and save their own lives uh, while they still had it because they never knew when uh, or if the pandavas would find them and murder them sometime so um they basically run away, they go a distance of about 2-3 miles away and then they hide inside the forest, recuperating and they just wait for someone to come their way so they can find out what's happened in the war. So Shalya Parva sort of ends with this and this is where we go to the <clears throat> Hrida Praveshan Parva. 
Hrida Pravesham Parva is the Parva that deals with Duryodhana getting into the lake. Now, those of you who know the Mahabharata, you'll know that at the end of the war, Duryodhana uh, leaves Kurukshetra and uh, that is the field of battle. And he goes into the lake Dwaipayana and he hides inside the lake. And it is in this lake that the Pandavas find him and the final Gadayod that actually takes place. Um, <clears throat> So you see Duryodhana, you know, you, you you see the perspective of the war. So in the last few chapters at the end of Shalya Parva and the Hrida Pravesha Parva, you see the perspective shift from first, it's from uh, Ashwatthama, Kripa and Kritavarma's perspective where they see, they feel like everything's lost and it's done and so they'll leave. Then the narrative shifts to Duryodhana's perspective where Duryodhana cannot see anybody. He has seen Shalya killed, he has seen Uluka killed, he has seen Shakuni killed. He cannot see Ashwatthama, he cannot see Kripa, he cannot see Kritavarma. So he feels that they are dead. And he believes, wrongfully he believes that I am the only one alive in my army. Apart from a few foot soldiers, I don't think there's anybody left. So I think it's time that I leave from here. So he does leave now again this this one moment you know you again you question is it cowardice on the part of Duryodhana is he is he uh, wrong in leaving his army and escaping to save his life uh, is it or should we show him some compassion because I think most of us would do that even even if we were battling with other people I know it's it's easy to kind of sit on a moral high horse sit in a rivalry tower and say that I would never do that if I were in his position I would die a noble kingly death a warrior's death I would face my enemies proudly but honestly speaking if we were ever in such a violent situation yes we may have done something to instigate that war instigate that fight but at the end of the day every one of us has that survival instinct we all want to save our own lives and so it is understandable why Duryodhana was afraid and he left and so he goes and hides inside the lake and I've always wondered, you know, growing up, how on earth did Duryodhana develop the lung capacity to breathe <laughs> underwater? Um, and the answer that they've given in the book is that he uses magic to kind of solidify the the lake and leave a small pocket of air around himself. So I don't know how that works. Uh, but genuinely, I'm just curious, uh, you know, how long people can actually hold their breath for because he seems to be there for quite some time. So Rida Pravesha Parva is uh, about you know him getting into the water and the Pandavas they are searching for Duryodhana they can't find him. Uh, Bhima tells a couple of hunters you know you if you find uh, Duryodhana please let us know. So he, he kind of sends this message to all the supporters of the Pandavas. Uh, during this time uh, Sanjaya comes across you know Sanjaya is almost caught again. That's one thing that you know that that honestly defies logic because. For the largest time till day 18, Sanjay has just been a narrator because he's a bard, right? He's a narrator. He's a storyteller. And he doesn't actually participate in the war. But on day 18, in the last few hours, somehow Sanjay has found himself wearing an armor, holding weapons and actually fighting the Pandavas. And Satyaki almost kills him until Veda Vyasa comes and stops him and says that, no, he's a bard. You cannot hurt him. He's supposed to carry these messages back to Dhritarashtra. So let him go. So I don't understand how this happened and honestly that's a very confusing moment for me in the book. Uh, doesn't make sense. So <laughs> I'm just gonna skip past that. Uh, so Sanjay is going towards Hastinapura and that's when he sees uh, Duryodhana entering the lake. And then he sees him and he goes a little forward then he sees Ashwatthama, Kripa and Kritavarma and he tells him this is what Duryodhana is doing and so the three of them go meet Duryodhana. And they speak to him and while they're speaking, a few of the hunters that Bhima has commissioned to search for Duryodhana overhear this and then they go and tell the Pandavas that this is where Duryodhana is. And the Pandavas with Krishna, Dishtadumna, Shikhandi and their sons, they come to the lake and they challenge Duryodhana. So they speak a lot of, so they have a conversation. And uh, the funniest part of this entire Hrida Pavesha Parva was uh, where, you know, Duryodhana says, you know, I'm resting. Why don't you also rest? And then tomorrow we can resume our fight. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think Duryodhana is the only one who has the gall to actually say such things um, in a war. Uh, <laughs> that was actually quite funny. Um... Yudhishthira uh, says, no, I am not tired. My brothers are not tired. We just want to finish this. So come out of the war. Show us what kind of a man you are. Let's finish this. And Duryodhana says, okay, I'll come. And Yudhishthira, okay, see, I, Yudhishthira might be a good person, might be a very dharmic person, but he is also a very foolish person. Because in the Hridha Pravesha Parva, you actually see Yudhishthira talking, you know, telling Duryodhana, you know what? 
I don't want to be unfair to you. I don't want to get gain my victory by having all five of us fight against you and defeating you. Rather, I want to gain this victory fair and square. So you can choose a weapon of your choice uh, and a and a and a fight of your choice, and you can pick any one person who you want to fight with you. And if you defeat that one person and kill that one brother of ours, you you become king and we will become your vassals. But if we kill you, we become the king. buddy wrong move krishna is so pissed off <laughs> krishna is pissed off and um, he scolds rishra and he actually calls him that you're foolish you are squandering away the opportunity that you have right now so many people died because of you they died for you and you are doing this again see misplaced compassion uh, so you know we have discussed about misplaced misplaced compassion in the previous few videos as well again misplaced compassion here and uh, but but luckily luckily for us you know duryodhana chooses the gadha because he's the he's the the club is what he is the strongest at he learned it from balrama himself krishna's brother and uh, he says you know what any of you come forward i don't care who comes forward killing any one of you will will make it uh, worth it for me and because bhima is the only one who can actually physically match duryodhana in terms of strength and in terms of the weapon because kada yuddha is not something that the other brothers have learned Duryodhana and Bhima were both Balrama's disciples when they learned Kada Yudha from him. So Bhima says, "I will fight you." And he, anyways, Bhima has also taken a vow that he will kill Duryodhana, right? So he he feels like I need to do this, otherwise I can't fulfill my pledge that I have taken. And the Rudra Pravesha Parva ends just before they are about to start the fight. The next parva which we come to is the Tirtha Yatra parva, and this is, I think, one of the most interesting parvas that you have uh, in the volume seven of the critical edition of the Mahabharata, because this Tirtha Yatra parva actually covers all the Tirthas <clears throat> that Balrama has visited um, during the time when the Kurukshetra war was taking place. So while the Kurukshetra war was taking place, you know, Balrama refused to participate in the war because he actually cares about Duryodhana, but he doesn't want to go against his brother Krishna as well. So he decides to step out of the war itself, and so then he goes on a pilgrimage to various sites around the Saraswati, and he uh, and and this parva, Tirtha Yatra parva, describes where all he went, and it is such an interesting, interesting, interesting section. I think if you can also get your hands on this Tirtha Yatra parva in volume seven, please do read it. you get to meet so many new characters you get to hear of so many stories that we never hear in mainstream uh, narratives of the mahabharata you hear about you know uh, <clears throat> why the moon that is chandra got tuberculosis you hear about the stories of sages like ekta dvita and trita uh, you hear about the father of vedic astrology whose name was garga you hear about uh, sage manakananda and how he fathered the maruts you hear about uh, you know the curse that vishwamitra put on saraswati which turned her water into into blood uh, you hear about uh, how the rakshasas got their own share of uh, food and uh, um, again all of these are very beautiful beautiful stories and uh, where the brahmanas actually accept that uh, they are oppressing the rakshasas and they should not be doing this it that section is actually there it's, it's so interesting um <clears throat> you hear about skanda's birth skanda's birth was also mentioned i believe in volume 3 uh, but again you get the whole story here uh, you hear about uh, why agni disappeared due to bhrigu's curse um and uh, you also hear a lot about oh and one really really interesting story is you hear about how shiva was so impressed with arundhati and how he made how he announced to see because aptashis are considered to be the greatest sages and that their austerities are so powerful but shiva saw how how uh, compassionate arundhati was and how strong her austerities were that he declared to the entire universe that arundhati's austerities will always be higher than that of the aptashis so beautiful beautiful section there are a lot more other stories like that so i'm just not going to talk a lot about the tirtha yatra parva because i really want all of you to read it if you can after the tirtha yatra parva you have the gadha yuddha parva the gadha yuddha parva takes place between bhima and duryodhana and both of them use the gadha, the club a stone club as their weapon um the gadha yuddha parva interestingly the fight between bhima and duryodhana is only a few pages in length and very interestingly to me Duryodhana's death. <clears throat> so, as you know, so I'm, I'm very, very quickly. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is, Duryodhana is a better fighter with the club than Bhima. 
while Bhima has pure strength, Duryodhana has strength, skill and technique and he's a better fighter. Plus Duryodhana had got a metal statue of Bhima made and for 13 years practiced Gadayudha with that and he also had pure hatred for the Pandavas which also added you know, fuel to the fire. So in for all intents and purposes, uh, Duryodhana was a better warrior than Bhima at Gadayudha. So Krishna knows this and so he uh, tells Arjuna to tell Bhima that you that you must tell Bhima that he has to break dharma, he has to kill Duryodhana unfairly, otherwise Duryodhana cannot be killed. And so he slaps his thigh and uh, Bhima realizes what he's saying and so when Duryodhana jumps up in the air to avoid Bhima, Bhima then uh, takes the gadha and then he hits Duryodhana on the thigh. Breaking the most cardinal rule of Gadayodha is that you cannot hit under the belt. That is, you cannot hit under the waist. You can only attack people on the chest and on the head, but on the arms, but not under the waist. And he breaks that one cardinal rule and Duryodhana is his entire hip and thigh and everything is broken and he is bloody and he falls down and he cannot get back up. Interestingly, you know, I had built up this moment so much in my head and I'm sure everyone else who reads this epic also builds this up in their head because you know, Duryodhana is such a big giant character and the entire Mahabharata is driven on his jealousy, anger and hatred and on the Pandavas wanting to seek vengeance against him that you imagine that the Gadayudha is going to be much grander on a much grander scale Surprisingly, the Gadayudha was actually very subtle. You do find out that they're good warriors, both of them. But Duryodhana's actual killing is very pedestrian. It's very simple. It's a very matter of fact. In just a single sentence, you see that, oh, Bhima broke his thigh and Duryodhana fell down and could not get back up. And he loses. It feels so anticlimactic in a way. But it also feels very real, you know, because when you think of how Bhishma was, he's not dead yet, but how he was brought down, you know, hundreds of arrows on his back and he's now lying on a bed of arrows, how Drona was brought down, you know, the elephant was called Ashwatthama was killed and so he lets go of his weapons and, and Drishtadimna beheads him, how Karna was killed, you know, when he's trying to uh, desperately pull out the wheel of his chariot and he's killed from behind. They're all such large deaths, I would say. They're all such dramatic deaths. In comparison, Duryodhana's feels so matter of fact. And that, that, it makes me feel like that's why Duryodhana's death must have been the actual representation of how Duryodhana died. Because over time, you know, the, the Mahabharata was embellished, it was added to, it was modified. And there is a chance that a lot of other people's characters, uh, deaths and fights were, were uh, dramatized beyond reality. But Duryodhana's very matter of fact death is, um, is what makes me feel that that is exactly possibly how it had happened. Now after Duryodhana is brought down, Bhima is happy but he's also very disrespectful. And this is one thing that is so conflicting because after Duryodhana has been brought down, you know, they say never speak ill of the dead, never uh, tamper with a dead body or never tamper with a dying person's body. But Duryodhana repeatedly keeps kicking, sorry, Bhima repeatedly keeps kicking Duryodhana's head and keeps saying wild things to him. Everyone present there who were, who were happy that Duryodhana was defeated is suddenly feeling disgusted with Bhima's behavior. Krishna is unhappy with Bhima's behavior. Yudhishthira feels shame, but Yudhishthira doesn't stop him. And in the end, it it takes Balrama, who is so pissed off. He's not only pissed off that, you know, Bhima broke the one card in the rule and he hit uh, Duryodhana below the, uh, the waist. He hit him on the thigh. But he's disgusted by Bhima's uh, showcase of victory, where he is repeatedly kicking Duryodhana in the head and saying wild things to him. Balrama is pissed off and he curses Bhima saying that every because of what you did you will be re remembered with condescension and disdain as the person who broke dharma to win the war but Duryodhana will always be honored as a respectable warrior who won the war who, who lost the war I would say rather fair and square and then he leaves <clears throat> and Krishna is upset because Balrama is upset because you know their relationship their, their brothers their relationship is also so strong 
and krishna actually scolds yudhishthira like why did you let him do this why could you stop him why were you just standing still and quietly and watching bhima do this and yudhishthira defend defends bhima saying that you know i i you know he duryodhana did all this to us that's why bhima did this and i i support him anyways what's done is done so let it go so you see you know like uh, yudhishthira is supposed to be dharma raja he is supposed to be the knower of dharma and it is not and it is completely against dharma to treat a dying person the way bhima is treating duryodhana and again we are not excusing duryodhana for whatever he has done in the past but the reality is that this is not how you treat people <laughs> but you see that that yudhishthira is like i won i don't care anymore you know what's done is done duryodhana had it coming he's he's got that kind of attitude so you see this um this this very uh, this this dilemma of morality i would say dilemma of dharma and in fact the entire gada yudha parva till the very end of the book which is the last parva of volume 7 you see that there that this dilemma in morality is this dilemma in dharma exists you know in his in his dying moments duryodhana accuses krishna you know he says you know you tell me that i have broken dharma but you have broken dharma repeatedly you have you 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 went and you know you told in order to save arjuna you used you forced karna to uh, use his uh, weapon against ghatot gaja and in that way you broke dharma by deliberately having bhima son killed um, you told uh, your you told the pandava army to kill bhurishrava who had given up his arms and was willing to die to murder him you have killed innocent people who were not at all part of the war like for example i believe this was bhurishrava's father or was it um, jarasandha's father i'm sorry am i my the, the, the details are giving away but you will you will remember this from volume 6 he accuses krishna of doing so many things which which sort of break uh break the rules of conduct which are considered crimes which are considered adharma and which is not decent or dignified behavior so he he tells krishna that you know what you say that i am doing the wrong things but you have consistently been doing the wrong things and you have made uh, you have made your victory uh by 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 being deceitful and you know see he's, he's he basically says you know you uh, you slaughtered thousands of kings through unfair means is there someone more wicked than you right and uh, then he talks about uh, and he talks about how he instigated shikhandi to kill bhima by by you know removing her, his hair and appearing like a woman so that bhishma would drop his arms he talks about how drishta how ashwatthama the elephant was killed and then it was misrepresented to drona that ashwatthama the son was killed uh, about how karna was killed when his back was turned and he says all of these things and he says you know if you had fought karna bhishma drona and me through fair means you would not have won and krishna agrees and i think this is one of the one of those instances because you know when when people talk about krishna everyone wants wants people to say only good things about krishna um because they feel like he's a god so he should be given a free pass for whatever he's done because it's dharma because he's a god and he says so I think that's a very very narrow minded way of looking at things and I I don't mean any disrespect to anyone but that's a very narrow lens to look at things because the reality is that Krishna was a very complex character and in the entire mahabharata one thing that I really really respect Krishna for and and the reason why I really like Krishna's character is not because he's completely good or he's completely right it's because Krishna is a master strategist and krishna knows that sometimes you need to bend the rules or completely even break them in order to achieve your goals and krishna is very 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 honest and upfront when he says that i know i have not done all this for the greater good i have done this because the pandavas are my friends they are my brothers because you know they are the cousins right kunti was vasudeva's sister they are my friends they are my brothers and i did this for them and i know that if i had not encouraged them to break these rules of uh, conduct if i had not asked them to bend dharma and break dharma then they would have lost so and i take care of my own and that is why i encourage them to do this and i don't think that is wrong so krishna very openly admits that he had selfish motives governing him him when he when he encouraged the pandavas to break the rules and when i say selfish i mean it in the sense that 
this is not something like you know where uh, the world's fate will change if Duryodhana loses and Yudhishthira becomes king because see no matter what Duryodhana's flaws were against the Pandavas in his personal life he might have been a very shitty cousin but as a king he was very good a lot of people loved Duryodhana his subjects revered him his army loved him his servants loved him and respected him so as a king Duryodhana was very good there was no such instance where Duryodhana was a bad king he was a bad cousin, he was a bad brother to the Pandavas, right? So Krishna admits that, yes, I took care of the Pandavas because the Pandavas are my friends. And I know that they cannot defeat you through fair means because you and your army were actually stronger than us. So I had to do what's best for my people. So that's one, that's one reason why I really respect Krishna because, you know, forget about what we all as people think, you know, how Krishna was above reproach or beyond reproach. Krishna himself agrees that, you know, he has broken the uh, broken the rules of dharma and that he deserves to hear, uh, hear uh, I would say, contempt and criticism from others for his role in the war. But he's also brave enough to accept it and say that, you know what, I will deal with the consequences. That's okay. I'm brave enough to do that. And I think we all as, as, followers of Krishna or as readers of the Mahabharata I think we need that one lesson I think which we can which we can learn from Krishna is to have the courage to accept the truth and to not uh, you know sugarcoat it and, and 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 change the narrative just to make everything seem like oh it's so black and white it's so fine and dandy I don't think that works I think the best respect we can give Krishna is to understand that he was a very complex character that had complex motives governing him and we should be willing to accept the consequences of whatever decisions uh, we take, right? I think that's one thing uh, I feel like Krishna can, you know, we can learn a lot from Krishna. So, at the end of the Gada Yudha Parva, Duryodhana uh, tells this to Krishna and then and then Krishna says like, you know, I, I protect my own and I we gave you a chance and you refuse to take it and this is what happens. You did this to yourself. And so we leave Duryodhana languishing in the in the uh, near the lake, and uh, just after the Galayudha. and the entire Pandava army goes to the Kaurava army because you know it's the it's the uh, you know a, a conquering king takes over the riches and the camps and the servants of the losing king, so they all go to the camp, and Yudhishthira at this time you know he's. He is, he is very upset. You know, there's something that really that happens uh, just before they go to the camp when Duryodhana and Krishna are speaking. And Duryodhana says, you know, uh, and he makes a really powerful statement, uh, which I think is very valid. So Duryodhana tells Krishna and Yudhishthira, you know, I have enjoyed being the king of the entire world. I have enjoyed uh, gaining suzerainty and control over other kingdoms. I have taken care of all the people in my kingdom, I have given gifts, I have given charity, I have done the sacrifices uh, to please the gods. I have lived my best life and I have not been subjected by any by any enemy rulers while I lived as a king. And now even when I'm dying, I'm gaining a Kshatriya's death by being killed in a battle and by being killed unfairly by Bhima, my merit also increases because I still fought fairly and I did not, I did not break the rules of the Gada Yudha. So I am more fortunate, no matter what you say, no matter what is done so far, I am the more fortunate person because you are now inheriting a kingdom that is broken. You are now inheriting a baggage of being the uh, immoral winners who broke dharma to win, who broke the rules to win. So I think I am the real winner of this entire war, even if you got the kingdom. Because while I will go to heaven, you will languish here. And it is such a powerful statement and it strikes a chord with Krishna, with Yudhishthira and with all the other Pandavas too. And it also struck a chord with me, I'm sure it will strike a chord with you. Because that's a fact, right? Who wants to inherit a kingdom filled with death, filled with hate simmering under the surface, filled with grief, right? Nobody wants to be the king of such a kingdom. What's the point? What's the point of having all your family killed, your friends killed? What's the point? And I think in that way, if you think about the Mahabharata, the true winner is Duryodhana. Yudhishthira is very upset after he hears this and he's scared of what Dhritarashtra and Gandhari think. 
um, in this section you also find out Gandhari's uh, power you know because he's, she's closed her eyes she has intense power that can either heal or that can burn the world to cinders and he's worried that Gandhari might curse them for killing all of the, her sons so he sends Krishna to go to Hastinapura to speak to Gandhari and Dhritarashtra and when Krishna goes he he very he doesn't mince words he tells Dhritarashtra this is your fault you encourage Shakuni to blind your sons uh, to be hateful towards their cousins so you did this to them you 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 caused their death and although Vidura and Bhishma Nirona told you not to encourage their bad behavior you didn't listen to anyone so this is your fault and he tells Gandhari before the war you had said let there be victory where dharma is and you knew when you said that that dharma was not on the side of your son and you still said this knowing that your son would die so you cannot grieve now or blame the Pandavas for these things having come to pass and Gandhari agrees and incidentally despite you know both of them at least Dhritarashtra is still feeling resentment both of them agree that uh, you know destiny you know had its place uh, their own behaviors towards Duryodhana had, 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 had been responsible for this and they say that we don't hold the Pandavas uh, responsible for what happened we finish the volume 7 um, you know where Krishna finds uh, he, he kind of finds out somehow that Ashwatthama is kill, planning to kill uh, the Pandavas and the Panchalas in the middle of the night and so he leaves back to go back to Kurukshetra and we leave Dhritarashtra and Gandhari in grief um, you know uh, remembering their sons and just thinking about uh, you know whether about how they could have done something different to prevent all of this massacre Overall, Volume 7 was a very emotional book and I think this book is something that uh, um, it focuses more on your emotional and mental uh, state. Uh, we leave this book feeling sad and honestly this book at the end of, the, at the end of Volume 7, um, you truly wonder, you know, because there are, there's a lot of things that, that happen in this book which make you wonder whether the Pandavas really deserve this victory. Because, you know, when you, like, you know, like, like I was saying in the, at the start of this uh, video the pandavas are always shown as people who are follow followers of dharma and who are on the side of the right who never commit any sin but again and again over the course of the 18 day war you see the pandavas breaking the rules repeatedly and doing things that are considered adharma and you honestly wonder whether duryodhana did deserve to die did he deserve to lose did yudhishthira and his brothers deserve to win there is there's no clear cut answer to that krishna himself agrees that uh, the pandava side had to break a lot of rules and had to bend dharma in order to win so i know when krishna says this himself and when he say that oh the, the victory is where dharma is is it is it really true is victory really where dharma is i i don't know um overall this book was very emotional um we end volume 7 uh, with Ashwatthama planning to kill the Pandavas and the Panchalas in the middle of the night. Volume 8 which is right here, this massive book, I think this is the largest book in the Mahabharata series. We look at what happens when Ashwatthama does get into the uh, Pandava camp. Then there's the three Parva which is going to be about the widows left behind. And then uh, we start uh, Bhishma's, uh, I would say, lessons to the shrine kingship and kinghood. Um, and I believe those lessons are actually co comprising of the majority of volume 8 and volume 9. So the war is done. Uh, maybe I'll make another video on the 18 day war itself because we've already crossed the one hour mark right now. Uh, so I don't want to take much of your time. And I'll discuss the war in detail. Uh, but overall, I think of all the 5, 6 and 7, the three, uh, 3 books of the war, Volume 7 was the most emotional. The war is finally done, but uh, the, the work of rebuilding the kingdom is yet to start and uh, we, have, we have some way to go. And incidentally, Shalya Parva ending is just halfway through the entire Mahabharata epic. <laughs> so we still have halfway to go. Alright, if you watched uh, this video so far, thank you so much for watching. Do let me know what you think about Volume 7 and I will see you next time on Tales in Text. Have a wonderful day and a very happy Ganesh Chaturthi and Gauri Puja to all of you. Alright, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.